We are here with Callum, who is also known as Tetracan. I wanted to make a video, how to fix your four track cassette recorder. If you don't know anything about fixing machines, you have seven points that you want to talk about. So step one was make sure it has power, right? <laughs> it's a dog, like we're fucking dog. You go crazy. <laughs> oh my God. And that's Step one, make sure that your Porta Studio has power. What that involves is going to kind of depend on which Porta Studio you've got. Like, roughly speaking, there's there's two categories. Like, there's little ones that you could fix in the backpack, and usually they've got, like, a separate um, AC to DC adapter, so, like, a wall war. Um, sometimes people lose the original. It must be the correct polarity. Um, if you put positive tip into a negative tip machine, it won't work. If you, and vice versa. Uh, usually Fostex is positive tip and Tascam's negative tip. But the first thing to check is that, you know, if you've got that external wall war, is the AC to DC adapter the correct polarity, the correct voltage? Um, current is normally a problem. Most uh, most of these things don't actually draw a lot of current, so that's the third parameter. It doesn't matter, matter too much. If that's correct, then you've got one of these little ones, then um, sometimes the little socket where that wall wart is plugged in, um, there's going to be broken solder at the base of that. That's okay. Um, there's going to be one big electrolytic capacitor in there, and uh, sometimes that'll go and if you replace that then the power will come back if those three things don't work then you know maybe you've got like a more complex um, electrical problem on your hands and that's outside the scope of what I can talk about here um, the other alternative is if you've got one of the larger units where the transformer that takes the AC that's in your wall and turns it into DC that the circuits can use is actually inside it. Those will have internal fuses like um, slow blow fuses usually mounted on the same board as the transformer. Uh, the transformer is going to be a big brass looking thing, big magnet points of wire on it. It's going to be pretty easy to identify. Um, if the fuse inside the plug hasn't gone, you still want to open it up and check that those fuses are okay. Um, you know, you can test that with a continuity tester on a digital multimeter. And um, there have been times in the past where I've bought things like uh, 44 Mark IIs, 464s, a couple of them I bought and just changed the fuses and they worked again. And there was nothing else wrong with them. So Cool, just like in a in an amp, same idea. Okay, so number two was open it up and inspect for like obvious damage and things like that, right? The following steps are going to be cleaning and uh, lubrication, so you need to open it anyway. But before you start that, you know, sometimes you can identify like there's a broken wire, someone's been in there and tried to fix something else and haven't plugged the cable in. So um, I live in a fairly remote area of the north of the Scotland. I'm always buying stuff off eBay. I never get the, a chance to. Um, test it before I buy it and quite often I've bought something that's got you know a fault where or apparently it's not responding to the buttons and someone's been in there maybe to change rubber or something because they read on the internet that's what they're meant to do and a cable's been left out so sometimes you can get an easy fix by just looking over it and seeing that there's something obviously broken like you know something looks burnt something's unplugged something's snapped yeah I, I went through a whole machine one time I'll, I'll link to that video until I just traced back and I was like oh my god if there's just obvious an obvious break if I had just looked for that in the first place, I would have saved myself, you know, a couple hours of time. Step three, clean pots, faders, and the transport. I include lubrication here as well. So um, just basically moving parts needs to be cleaned and lubricated. And, you know, there's no advantage to like getting dust off a printed circuit board, but things like uh, pots and faders, the dust will actually get inside them and that can actually stop the electricity from getting through. So you really want to deal with that before you do any electrical testing, because sometimes you'll think, oh, I've got a dead channel, oh, I've got a dead track, and it's actually lint or dust or something is preventing this um, signal from getting through the circuit. Um, so, you know, you could use contact cleaner. You definitely want to follow up that up with a good electrical lubricant because sometimes a uh, contact cleaner will actually dissolve the lubricant that was put into these things at the factory. And then likewise for the cassette transport, the mechanical part of the tape recorder, a lot of issues you'll find you know, oh, it doesn't work. Well, it does. It just needs new grease on it. You know, old grease can turn to glue over time. Um, if you can take that apart a little bit, like wipe off old grease with isopropyl alcohol, put on, I use silicon grease. There's alternatives um, to lubricate it, reassemble it. Then um, that will save you a lot of headaches thinking that your cassette player doesn't work. And we're, we're several steps in. All these things could have cured a machine and you don't need to have any crazy knowledge to do this. All you got to do is... No. Don't be no, afraid to open no, it. No, I mean, there's like maybe soldering skills for the sorting out the electrical stuff, but 
but that's a maybe. I mean, the, you know, a good proportion of the stuff that I buy in, like, well, I don't do a lot of that now, but when I bought a lot of stuff in, I would say a good third of it, um, it was like absolute basic monkey skills that we were needed to get it working. There really wasn't any electrical or you know technical knowledge required. Step, step four or five, change rubber is the next step. Yeah, step four, I would change the rubber on the transport um, as much as possible. We... <coughs> Sorry, you can edit that. <laughs> uh, we cleaned and um, lubricated the transport first because we don't want any of the like cleaning or lubrication fluid to get on the rubber. But um, so many problems with the cassette player are just because there are rubber parts in there um, that you know transfer the energy from the motor to other moving parts, and over time, rubber will turn into tar. And before that happens. It will go hard or it will go brittle and it causes all sorts of problems. So unless you know for a fact, like, you know, it was owned by your friend that you trust and they said that they definitely changed the rubber belts three years ago, I would assume that the rubber in there is old. Um, if you've got like a 90s unit, so I'm like talking about like 424 um, and onwards, you might get away without changing things like the pinch roller. You could probably leave the pinch roller in there, but um, anything older than that, things like 244, 246, you really want to change pinch roller. You want to change idler tires in there. If you skip that step, um, that's going to come back and bite you in the proverbial. Um, the amount of headaches that I caused myself um, when I was learning to do this by thinking that I could skip changing such and such a rubber part, change all of it. When I get... A uh, port studio or something like that. I change the rubber. I change the rubber. The, anytime I haven't changed something when I had a part available to me, I've you know come to regret it. Now we're at a fancier step. Now here's a step where some people might get freaked out, but this is rebuild, rebuild and test. You know, use jars, use colored markers to so just put things back in the same order. You know, in reverse order to what you disassembled them, and you should be fine. Um, but at that point, you can test the unit. You want to play back a cassette. Um, most units, even if it plays back at the wrong speed, you could use a pre-recorded cassette. You know, the kind of thing you'd buy for your car in like the the eighties and the nineties, and that's adequate. You don't need a special playback t- tape. Well, it's handy to have, but it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, and then you can make some test recordings. That will tell you whether the playback and record amplifiers that are associated with the cassette player work. It will tell you whether the mixer works, and it will give you like a list of things that are too quiet or too loud or not working at all. You don't do any testing until you've yeah. cleaned it, I, I, changed rubber. I, I consider it a waste of time to do any electrical testing until the thing's been cleaned, lubricated, and the rubber's been replaced. Because, um, I mean, for instance, like from a buyer's perspective, a lot of times when people are, are like listing these things, they'll say, oh, it's fine, you just need to change the rubber. If your cassette player isn't working, you know, you haven't cleaned it, lubricated it, and put rubber in it, then you can't test the recorder playback amplifiers. You often can't test all the facilities of the control system or the mixer. Um, So really, in a situation like that, the seller is only vouching for the mixer. The mixer might seem like it's got problems, but then those go away if you properly clean the faders and the pots. So I would, other than checking that it powers on, I don't do any electrical testing until I've had it open, cleaned, lubricated, changed the rubber and put it back together. Then I test it. I think some people like like would be nervous. They would be like, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of thing. That you got steady hands, you've taken these things apart a bunch of times. What do you say to somebody who's like, well, yeah, it's got some symptoms, but I'm worried if I go through this complicated teardown, I can't get it back together again. That is a risk. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, I mean, I try and, you know, using my channel, give people as much kind of good practice and heads up about the pitfalls as I can. Um, but I mean, certainly in the process of learning it, yeah, I mean, I did cause, you know, not terrible problems, but I caused small problems. And then, you know, it was a learning process figuring out what I did wrong um, because I mean w- when we get to step seven that's a rinse and repeat it's like the iterative process and part of that iterative process is like compensating for your own fuck ups frankly okay so so I think we're at we're at step six I think it became seven whatever the next step is use logic and a basic understanding to figure out roughly which bit of the circuit board is fucked up I, I mean I try and encourage like a basic conceptual understanding of what is like going on there that you know the same way that you've got a car right it's like you, know, you can break that down into like suspension, brakes, engine, exhaust. You know, so if it's noisy, it's 
it's probably exhaust. You know, if you've got a problem where playback's great, but the recording isn't good, then that's going to be, um, that's got to be on the record amplifier. You know, for instance, these units, they all use a shared head for recording and playback. So if you get playback on all four heads, um, all four segments of the head, but you haven't got recording on, say, the fourth track, that is not the head's fault. Because if it was the head's fault, you wouldn't get playback on that track either. So, you know, it's like little things to do with deduction there. That means it must be the record amplifier. So that already means, okay, I don't need to look at this board that's got like the power stuff on it. And I don't need to look at this board that's got the mixer stuff in it. And I don't need to look at tracks one, two or three of the record section. I'm only looking track four of the record amplifier. You, you see how you can figure that out? So yeah. that, that's the kind of thing that I mean. There are relatively simple ways that, you know, say you're on that just one track in this hypothetical situation where you're fixing track four of a record amplifier. Um, maybe there's like 20 um, electrolytic capacitors on there. Electrolytic capacitors are quite a common cause. Um, you know, bad solder is quite a common cause of electrical faults. Electrolytic capacitors like little barrels that have got a seal on them. No seal is perfect. So, you know, they usually last pretty well, but some of these things are 30, nearly 40 years old and the seal's gone a little bit and that makes the um, circuit janky. So you can go, well, it, the signal's here and it's not here, it's here and it's not here. Okay, so it must be stopping about here. And then you can change like four capacitors, touch up some solder there, reassemble and see if it works. And, you know, eight times out of 10, um, that's you fixed it. There's certain things in a portal studio, like if your heads, if the little coils inside there break, which can happen just from physical force rather than they actually get worn down. You know, that, that's a problem. You need a, like another donor faders. If they actually get corroded inside and break, um, you really need the donor. Um, so some things aren't being made anymore and that, that's a problem, but capacitors, they're still in production. Very easy to get hold of. There's fakes out there. So, you know, really you want to go to a good wholesaler like DigiKey or Mouser or something. But, you know, most of them, the small values, like you're talking probably 20, 30 pence, you know, maybe 50 cents at most. You know, Occam's razor. Occam's razor is the idea that, like, you know, whatever is the most obvious solution probably is the solution most of the time. So you go, right, this is my, um, this is the obvious cause of my problem. Try and attend to it. Test the game. Right. Has it um, fixed my problem? Yeah, it has, you know, eight out of, eight of 10 times. But then the other proportion of the time, you've got to go back and find something more complicated. But I, I think dry joints, old solder, um, leaky caps are going to fix a lot of like signal getting through system issues. The last step is to repeat the last two steps again until you solve it, right? No, until it's fixed. I mean, basically you would uh, rebuild, test, um, you know, make sure you're getting signal through everything in the mixer, that you're getting playback from all the tracks, um, that you can record to all the tracks, that the playback and the recording is loud enough or quiet enough and not distorted and weird. And, um, you know, you make a little checklist of things you want to fix. You go back in and you try and fix them and then you rebuild and you test again. And that is a an iterative process until it's working all working or all working enough that you can start making music with it anyway making music eh, we're just messing with gear here there, there's one more thing i want to ask you that i think some people would, would want to know the answer to which is what is a symptom that if you saw on a machine like don't buy it because because you know we're just everyone's buying these old ass machines on craigslist and that that you know we, we might if we're lucky we'll get a chance to just check it out briefly what is a symptom that if you ever see it in a machine, don't buy this machine. Uh, a symptom, I, I, I tell you, at the moment I wouldn't buy a TAC 144. They have terrible problems getting the transport to work properly. So yeah, if I saw a TAC 144, unless they said, this is definitely still working, and you were like, oh great, I've got some demos that I made on a TAC 144 in 1982 that I want to hear back. Okay, then I would buy it and I would digitize those recordings. But otherwise, I wouldn't buy one of those because, um, you know, it's the earliest Porta Studio. The system for turning the reels inside the cassette is like really over-engineered. I mean, you gave a really comprehensive game plan for how to fix your machine. And the first several steps really don't take any knowledge. It's a matter of 
inspecting, understanding that these machines have really easily replaceable, easy sourceable rubber parts. And with a little bit, I mean, I had zero soldering knowledge. I got a solder machine for 10 bucks and I, I fixed several machines that were, people told me were yeah. totally messed up. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. Soldering is not like a big deal. The only thing I'd say is like, you know, make sure that you get an iron that, that will go hot enough. Right, right. Being able to use a screwdriver and a soldering iron and a little bit of like, deduction a little bit of conceptual understanding of what's happening in there that that's really all you need to fix 80 percent of these things well i've learned a lot we laughed we cried <laughs> callum tetracan thanks so much for coming on and uh sharing your knowledge and i'll link to your channel below it's a great channel and hopefully we'll have another discussion soon okay thanks travis yeah man